UFC 300 is finally here. It has 13 fights with 12 former or current champions. That is the most amount of champions on one card in the history of the UFC. Will UFC 300 live up to the hype? Will it make up for the fact that we have been drudging through the depths of hell to get through such a spectacular card? My name is Angelo. This is We Want Picks, and I am going to break down the entire UFC 300 fight card, giving you my picks, predictions, and bets. But before I do... Let's take a look at the success that has been pay-per-views in 2024. Jacob and I have absolutely crushed pay-per-views this year. 4-0 in the safety parlay. We've only had three pay-per-views, but I gave you four safety parlays on the year, crushed all of them. Those safety parlays netted more than three units of profit with an 83% ROI. Jacob and I's combined bets on pay-per-views this year will give you almost 12 units of net profit, almost 30% return on investment. We dominate pay-per-views. Some people actually call us the pay-per-view boys, and they spell it with a Z. No cap. I mean, I told myself, like, hey, UFC 300, it's going to be a big card. We're going to get a lot of new eyes. Make sure that if the viewers take anything away from your video, it's that you're young and cool. And I, I absolutely, as soon as I said no cap, I know all of you were like, that guy is young and cool. So welcome to the show. A little closer look at that safety parlay. It continues to do well across the board, not just pay-per-views. And you can unlock the safety parlay and everything else that we provide for only $10 an entire month. Safety parlay is one single parlay, sometimes two, that I put on the board for every single event. It is nine and oh in the last six pay-per-views. And again, some of these pay-per-views, I find some spots and I give you more than one parlay for the event. Seven units of net profit across those pay-per-views. I've hit 12 of the last 17 parlays. It hits at an almost 70% win rate with a lifetime ROI of, again, almost 30%. The safety parlay continues to be the most stable bet in this very unstable sport. You can unlock this at wewantpicks.com. Just click become a member at the top. It's only $10 for an entire month. You're going to get far more than just one single event. And you're going to get far more than some bets. We also provide tools. One of those tools is the line movement tracker. This is going to give you the opening odds, the current odds, the win probability, and the line movement for every fighter on every card. You're going to get the detailed data metrics and analytics. 38 columns of information that you can use to find spots, to avoid spots. I personally like to use this for prop bets. I have been crushing prize picks and underdog fantasy because it's very easy for me to pull up this spreadsheet, see takedown lines, see significant strike lines, see their opponent's defense in both of those categories, and boom, I have my spots. You're also going to get the best DraftKings ownership projections in the game. Here are the real numbers for UFC Vegas 90. We quite literally had the best projections in the world, beating out the giant titans of the industry like the Osimos and the Roto Grinders. And then those ownership projections will be preloaded into the DraftKings Optimizer. This will build DraftKings fantasy lineups for you, and it is preloaded with the best ownership projections in the game. This entire package, every single thing that I just mentioned, and so many more that I can't mention because I don't have enough time, is only $10 for an entire month. We don't do weird tiers. We don't separate betting from fantasy and then try to con you in the pain for both. Everything that we do is only $10 for an entire month. Wewantpicks.com. Click Become a Member at the top. But wait, there's more. It's not just my bets and Jacob's bets and the tools. We also have other analysts. Artem is giving you his PFL bets, his Cage Warrior bets, breakdowns for every single event outside of the UFC. And Artem went 10-2 and two at UFC Vegas. And the Pick Doctor, this gentleman, is a nuclear physicist who has developed an artificial intelligence that picks fights at an alarmingly high rate. All of this, we want picks.com. Click Become a Member at the top. Let's go ahead and break down this card. I mentioned how many champions are on the UFC 300 fight card, and it's an astonishing number. We have 12 champions in 13 fights. Obviously, some of these fights are doubled up, and this is one of them. We have two former world champions, two guys that at one point in time, not that long ago, were known as the best on planet Earth at what they do, and now they are fighting each other in the very first fight on this card. We have Divas and Figueredo taking on Cody Garbrandt to open up the UFC 300 fight card. Davison Figueredo 
He's the former flyweight champion of the world. That is 10 pounds lighter than this weight class. And he's trying to reinvent himself by moving up to bantamweight. He's reinventing himself by not cutting the weight that he had to cut historically because he was very big for 125 pounds. And down at that weight, it helped him be powerful. It helped him bully. It helped him impose his will, but it also affected his cardio. His move to 135 pounds was successful in his last fight against Rob Font, where he basically turned into a Dagestani. He was a little Nurmaga Madoff brother in there, just shooting takedowns, holding that guy down, and riding out that decision. He is a well-rounded guy. He is dangerous everywhere. He does have some power in his hands. He's got some well-timed takedowns, and a BJJ black belt little bit of dog in him too. He's not a complete, we've seen him break. So he's not all, he's not Trevor Peak. We've seen him break, but he does have some dog in him. He's taking on Cody Garbrandt. This guy's the former bantamweight world champion. He has some highs. He's had some lows in the last five years. He's a phenomenal boxer, fantastic footwork with very real power. And when he's on, he is unbelievable. His win over Dominic Cruz is one of the best performances we have ever seen. His footwork was insane. The striking was clean. The takedown threat was there. But when he's off, he's winging punches, chasing the chin, and just getting absolutely knocked out cold. He is coming off of the first round knockout win over Brian Kelleher. And right off the rip, I'm going back and forth on this fight. My instant reaction was that Garbrandt's the better striker and the better wrestler. And also, he's bigger. But if Figgy comes in here and Figgy thinks that he's going to be a wet blanket and just lay on top for a win, he might have a rude awakening when he shoots that first shot and it is stuffed. But then I look at the records and I see that Cody has been knocked out hard four times in the last seven years. And it's not even just his chin that I'm worried about. His fight IQ is also concerning. The reason he's getting knocked out is because he's chasing knockouts. His chin is in the air, and he's like, I'm going to get you. And then he doesn't, and then he gets absolutely flatlined. And that's been the story of his last few years. The better fighter, winning fights, chin up in the air, bonk, straight down like a bag of sand. But ultimately, I keep going back to the fact that Cody Garbrandt is such a good wrestler with such clean boxing. Figgy should not have one-punch KO power at bantamweight. He didn't really have it at featherweight. Gaining 10 pounds isn't going to help that situation. What might help is he might be fast, but Cody is already insanely fast. Cody's also the younger fighter here, and if he still had a chin, well, he might be world champion if he still had a chin, but if he still had a chin, I'd be all in on Cody, but right off the rip, I'm going the underdog here. I am going to go Cody Garbrandt. I think his wrestling history will help him. That clean boxing will help him. And just being bigger in general will help. And Divas and Figueredo should not be able to push Cody Garbrandt around the same way he did Rob Font. Cody Garbrandt is the pick and an underdog right out of the gate. And that takes us to Jim Miller versus Bobby Green. And this is an interesting fight. Jim Miller has been around for one million years. He's a legend. He has literal records, multiple records in the UFC for longevity. He's the only fighter to have ever fought at UFC 100 and UFC 200, which is why Dana White put him on this card, UFC 300. He did win those other two fights. He can build an insane legacy that nobody else may be able to follow. He's a very good grappler. He's got clean boxing, decent wrestling. He's got all the veteran savvy that you would expect from a guy that has fought on many, many cards over the last 20 years. He's definitely starting to show his age, but he continues to defy it in the octagon. Most recently, he had a submission win over Gabriel Benitez, where his forward pressure, his striking, and his leg kicks look absolutely fantastic. But he's fighting Bobby Green. Bobby Green is not Gabriel Benitez. Bobby Green is a busy striker. He's got that showboat Roy Jones Jr. hands at his waist style. He's got good volume. He's got incredible defense with that Philly-ish shell. He's got slick wrestling as a backup plan. He hasn't used it since 2020, but he does have wrestling there as a backup plan. He has 11 knockouts under his belt. It's typically volume. It's not that big one hun, one hun. Man, I was, this was one take Ange. I, I guess it technically is if I leave this in. This was one take Ange. I was going to cruise through this and people are going to be like, that guy is young. That guy is cool. And he just did this whole thing with one take, no mistakes. And it's like, welcome, welcome new people who found us because of USC 3. But here I am, fumbling and bumbling. Bobby Green has 11 knockouts under his belt. They are typically volume-based and not that one-punch knockout power. He did one-punch knockout Grant Dawson, 
And we don't know if that was an actual punch or a hard sneeze because apparently Grant Dawson has zero chin whatsoever, but Bobby Green did just do that in October. Since then, he fought Jalen Turner where he was absolutely flatlined and the referee just refused to stop that fight. I don't like how this card is starting off. I mean, as a fan, I love it. Two good fights right off the rip. I love it. But as somebody who's supposed to sit here and say, this is who's going to win and this is how you should bet, I don't love it. Couple of tricky fights right out of the gate. We like our pay-per-views to have some very clear spots and so far, we don't have any. Bobby Green is a two to one favorite. I'm not sure why those odds are so wide. I'm not sure why Bobby Green is a two to one favorite. Yes, Jim Miller is 40 years old, but Bobby Green's 37. And arguably, Bobby Green has looked worse in the last few years of his career than Jim Miller has in his. In theory, on paper, skill-wise, Bobby should be the better striker. He should have good enough takedown defense to keep this fight standing. So he has to be the pick. If I'm just assessing the skill sets, Bobby Green's got good takedown defense. Bobby Green has better striking. Okay, this fight's standing. He's the better striker. So I have to pick Bobby here, but he has been full-blown knocked out two times in the last year. Jim Miller looks better now than he did when he was in his 20s. So I'm going to stay very far away from this fight betting-wise. You can't even look at the round line because one of these guys could get chin. Jim Miller's 40. Eventually, he is going to look 40. And Bobby Green has been knocked out twice. Drew Dober did it. Jalen Turner did it. Obviously, those are two completely different animals than Jim Miller. But I am going to lean Bobby Green very, very slightly. Minus 200 is absolutely absurd for this fight. And takes us to another former world champion, Jessica Andrade, and she's taking on Marina Rodriguez. That's for the people that said I cannot roll my R's. Jessica Andrade, former world champion, as I mentioned, and she's been a contender at multiple weight classes. She does bounce around quite a bit. She's beaten some of the best women on planet Earth. Technique-wise, she's a decent striker. She does have a ton of power, and she likes to be a bully. Her power is literally everywhere. She can push you around. She can pick you up and slam you like she did when she beat Rose Namajunas for the belt. And despite almost always being the shorter fighter, she will push you around that octagon. Her BJJ is not the best. Her takedowns are not technical, but she will force the fight to the ground and start pounding away. Jessica is all bully and very tough, but if she cannot push you around, she cannot win fights. She cannot win fights with pure technique. She's basically Trevor Peak with a little bit more technique. If you don't know who Trevor Peak is, go watch UFC Vegas 90. Uh, somebody let their dog that knows nothing in there try to fight. The guy tried the Indian burn his way to a win. It was insane. Anyway. That's Jessica Andrade, former world champion because she's tough, former world champion because she picked somebody up and slammed them on their head, former world champion because she has power in her hands and she will just march forward using all of it. She does bounce between weight classes and that doesn't always work out for her, but straw weight is where she should be. At least at straw weight, she can try to be big and try to be strong. She's coming off the knockout win over Mackenzie Dern where she seemed to return to her old form. She's taking on Marina Rodriguez. Marina Rodriguez is a very good boxer. She's got good solid speed and good power. She does have raw one-punch knockout power, but just okay takedown defense. She's tall for this weight class, and she uses that length to fight technical and stay on the outside. Overall, Marina Rodriguez is a complete fighter who can grind out a win or get a finish. She's coming off that TKO win over a typical, typically very durable karate hottie. The odds makers have this fight absolutely dead even, but the public has chosen a side. The public is very squarely on Jessica Andrade's side with a 78% pick. 78% of the public is saying Jessica Andrade wins this fight. Breaking down a Jessica Andrade fight is always tricky because she's almost never the better fighter. She's almost never the more technical fighter. Her technique is sloppy. She relies on being that bully. And that works when she's fighting the Lauren Murphys of the world. But when she can't close the distance to land those big looping shots or get a big takedown, she gets pieced up. So I have to lean Rodriguez here because she's going to be the better fighter. But Jessica being Jessica can absolutely come forward, make it ugly, and pull something off. I don't think any bets are safe in this fight. Certainly not everybody's favorite, which is a women's round line over. But I am going to go Marina Rodriguez here. She's just the better fighter. And she's going to keep Jessica at the end of her strikes, and Jessica's going to get pieced up. This, this head movement was Jessica getting jabbed in the face. That's what that is. And I think that's what's going to happen. Jessica, 
It's going to be tough. It's going to come forward. It's probably not going to be enough. Marina Rodriguez looked decent in her last fight. But as long as she avoids a lot of these clinch exchanges or if she's in a clinch, throw a bunch of knees, keep it against the cage, she should be good. Then we have the latest addition to the UFC 300 card. This is the newest fight that was added. It was only added about a month ago. So not a full training camp for either one of these guys. We have Jalen Turner taking on Hinato Moicano. And this should be a pretty straightforward fight, in my opinion. Jalen Turner is a very good boxer. He comes forward. He keeps the fight at range at the exact same time. He's one of the very few people that can move forward without being inside the pocket. He is long, and he uses that length really well. He's an incredible six foot three. And even though he is known as a striker, three of his last five wins are by submission, which just shows you how well-rounded he is. He's coming off that bad knockout win over Bobby Green where he had him 100% out, and like the referee did nothing. Just stood there like, oh, if you, if you want to, you can hit him six, seven more times. It's fine. And it was actually kind of hard to watch. He's taking on Hinato Moicano. Hinato Moicano is a high-level BJJ black belt who's also a technical striker. He does not have stoppage power, but he does have some nice volume and a good pace. The concern, though, is Hinato's chin. While Moicano can hang with the better striker just on a straight technique level plane, his chin doesn't always hold up to the test. He averages almost two takedowns per fight. He does have a 47% takedown accuracy, but as we all saw in his fight with Brad Riddell, he doesn't necessarily need to shoot a takedown to work in a scramble and get a submission. He's coming off that close win over Drew Dober where a late mistake by Drew is what locked in the win for Hinato. I mentioned this fight is the newest addition to the UFC 300 card. And nobody benefits from this more than Hanato Moicano. He was sort of a fly-under-the-radar kind of guy for a few years. And then he capitalized on Drew Dober's mistake. Drew Dober made a big-ass mistake in that fight. Hanato capitalized it. He won a fight that he was probably going to lose. And then he handled his post-fight speech perfectly. And now he is quietly becoming a, a favorite of the fans. People are starting to enjoy him and enjoy his content. Unfortunately, though, a boost in popularity is not going to be enough here. Jalen is a phenomenal striker with very good takedown defense. He should absolutely piece up Hanato Moicano, potentially win by finish. And the finish part is my only concern because Jalen Turner has quite literally never won a decision. Never. So we're going to need Jalen to put it on early, get in Moicano's face, piece him up, and remind him that there are levels to striking in this game. Jalen Turner is going to be the pick. I am pretty confident in him. Then we have a couple of younger prospects. We have Sadiq Youssef taking on Diego Lopez. And when I say younger prospects, obviously there's only one single fighter on this card that has not fought in the octagon before. So this is not a couple of contender series guys that they're trying to build up that we have seen in the last couple of months. These are guys that have been in the octagon multiple times over and are working their way up the ladder. But these are people the UFC believes in, which is how they got a slot on UFC 300. Diego Lopez specifically is a guy that I think the UFC is like, he can be something. He's got this ridiculous haircut that people seem to love. He has some power in his hands and he has some jujitsu and he's Mexican-ish. He's down there in Mexico training with Lupe Godinez, training with Alexa Grasso, and actually coaching a lot of those fighters. Diego Lopez is a dangerous grappler who's actually coaching some of the best fighters on the planet. And I've said that twice because it's shocking that this 29-year-old is Alexa Grasso's MMA coach. Not just straight jiu-jitsu coach. She's actually coaching her through MMA as well. And Alexa Grasso has looked absolutely fantastic. He doesn't have the best takedowns. He doesn't have the best takedown defense. But his BJJ is very dangerous. He's a well-rounded well enough guy, but likes to throw heavy power shots and chase finishes. His striking can get wild, but he keeps things in combinations and likes to methodically work forward. He's coming off that knockout win over Pat Sabatini, where a lot of us thought we were going to get a striking match. He's taking on Sadiq Youssef. Sadiq Youssef is going to be the best striker Diego Lopez has fought in the UFC. He's got good technique and very good power. He's got incredible speed and a wide variety of attacks. He is 7-2 and two in the UFC. He has basically outstruck every single opponent, including his two losses, the one to Arnold Allen and Edson Barbosa. He's got solid takedown defense at 62% and solid enough get-up game that if he is taken down, 
you won't really just ride him out and coast. He's coming off that main event loss to Edson Barbosa where they did drop each other, but it was Edson's three takedowns that nailed that down for him. This is a tricky fight because Diego Lopez is the more well-rounded fighter, right? He's got very dangerous BJJ, decent striking with some good power. But he's going to need to get this to the ground to win. He's going to need to wrestle to win. And he doesn't like to wrestle. Sadiq is the much better striker and is smart enough to know not to wrestle. Sadiq has good fight IQ and is going to know, eh, I'm not going to initiate my own takedowns here. That would be stupid. He's smart enough to know that I can't engage in a clinch because Diego might actually just pull guard on me and then I'm going to be in trouble. Diego has plenty of power, but the technique isn't going to quite be there at Sadiq's level. He also has plenty of submissions, but I don't think he's going to get this to the ground. I am going to pick the underdog here in Sadiq Youssef, but he is going to need to fight a perfect 15 minutes. Diego's plenty tough. Diego will absorb any punishment that comes his way. So Sadiq is going to have to fight on the outside, avoid a clinch because a guard pull might come in the clinch. We hate guard pulls, but that may happen. And if that's what Diego has to do to win this fight, then that's what he's going to do. So Sadiq is going to be the pick, and I think over two and a half rounds is going to be the sneaky good play here because I don't have odds for that yet, but it might be juiced on the under because they're going to see that Diego has a bunch of finishes. He is the favorite, so they may say, okay, under two and a half is the way to go. And we're going to go the over because I do think Sadiq stays on the outside. Sadiq is tough enough to avoid any trouble on the feet, certainly smart enough to avoid any grappling exchanges. So I do like Sadiq to win, and I do like the over on rounds. And then we have the only debut fighter on this card, and she's taking on one of the staples of the division. We have 42-year-old former world champion Holly Holm taking on two-time Olympic gold medalist Kayla Harrison in her UFC debut. We'll start with Holly Holm. She's the former bantamweight champion of the world. She has been fighting the upper echelon of this division for almost 10 years. She's an insanely talented kickboxer who has a ton of patience and has beaten the best women on the planet. She is 42 years old though. At this point, it's hard to tell if age matters with her style. She has been very technical. She has an impressive striking differential over 14 fights in the UFC. And age would matter if she relied on speed or if she relied on her chin, but that's not what she does. She sticks and moves well on the outside or she turns it in to a wrestling match against the cage. Neither one of those require youth or speed. She has some of the best fight IQ you'll see in any division, let alone this division. And she is coming off of that overturned submission loss to Myra Buena Silva because Myra tested positive for Ritalin. So you're going to see that her last fight is a no decision She won the first round in the second round, was holding on against the cage, and then she got choked. Ninja choked, to be specific. She's taking on Kayla Harrison. New face to the UFC, but not new to MMA and not new to combat sports. She's the only debut on this card, and she's making the UFC 300 fight card. She's the only debuting fighter on this card because she is a huge prospect in this sport and potentially the future of the division. She's the most accomplished American Judica of all time. A Judica is a judo practitioner. Just think Ronda Rousey, but instead of a bronze medal at the Olympics, she has two Olympic gold medals and a multiple, a bag of world and Pan American championships. She is absolutely tremendous. She is rock solid. Striking isn't great, but she does have power and she uses it to set up the takedowns, which we know she has because of that judo background. In 2015, we watched Holly Holm beat an Olympic judoka. She knocked out Ronda Rousey by staying on the outside and using her world-class striking. She never got close enough, or she never hung out long enough to get thrown by Ronda. But as much as my body fat and my hairline would like it to be 2015, it isn't. We are nine years past that. And Kayla is a very different animal. I think Kayla absolutely blows through Holly Holm here. I think there's going to be an early feel-out process. It's probably going to be a bit boring. Holly is very smart. Holly has no problem being in a boring fight. None. And she's smart enough and patient enough and disciplined enough to just chill. And I think Holly Holmes is going to stay on the outside. It's going to be extremely boring. She's going to do everything possible to stay far away. But Kayla's going to charge forward. She'll eat a shot or two. And she will get Holly to the ground. The biggest issue here, though, is not can Holly win if she's in the cage. If Holly makes it to the cage... I think she wins this fight. I'm not worried about it at all. 
Her biggest fight, the toughest fight, is going to be making weight. Kayla Harrison. I think I said Kayla before. If I said Holly, I'm talking about Kayla this whole time. Kayla's toughest fight is going to be making weight. Kayla Harrison fought in the PFL at 155 pounds. 20 pounds heavier than this weight class. Her most recent fight in the PFL was 150 pounds. She took off a nice five, beat the shit out of Aspen Ladd. But that is still 15 pounds heavier than she needs to be come fight night. She has never competed at a weight that low, not since she was significantly younger than she is. And that is going to be the issue. A lot of people like Holly Holm to win here, and that's why nobody... At least I haven't seen. Nobody is saying Holly Holm wins this fight because Holly Holm's the better fighter. Everybody is saying, who's on that side, Holly Holm wins this fight because Kayla Harrison isn't going to make the weight. She's going to be drawn out. She's going to be sucked out. She's going to gas. I'm not going to depend on that. I'm still going to pick Kayla Harrison. I'm obviously going to watch the weigh-ins very closely. But in my mind, Kayla Harrison is an absolute professional. Kayla Harrison is a two-time Olympic gold medalist. Kayla Harrison has won multiple world championships. Making weight is just something that she does. And yes, this is a much harder weight cut to make. But the reason she's so heavy is she's so fucking thick. She is jacked. So if Kayla Harrison has enough time, which she has had plenty of time, she will stop working out, drop the, the muscle, and make her weight that way. Now, if she was just huge and had giant wrists and giant, if she was Alex Pajeda, just massive human being, this would be different. But she's jacked and she can shed some of that muscle over the eight weeks or however long that she's known about this. So I'm not worried about her making weight. I am going to watch the weigh-ins though. I'm not going to place any bets until we see her there, until we make sure that all goes well. And if you don't know, if you're new here, Minty Bets. The woman on all the ESPN broadcasts, the woman that works for ESPN and works for UFC giving out her bets, also is here at We Want Picks, and she does a full weigh-in recap every Friday after the weigh-ins. So instead of watching two hours worth of weigh-ins, you can watch a three-minute video where she will catch you up, let you know what happened, who made weight, who missed weight, what's going on, who looked like Skeletor, and who looked fantastic. Go check out last week's for UFC Vegas 90. It was chaos. Four fighters missed weight. It was a complete disaster. But every Friday after the weigh-ins, come back here. Make sure you are subscribed. The bell is clicked. And do all of those things so that you do get those updates and those videos. Because honestly, the reason we do that video is I thought there was a gap in this space. You either watched two hours worth of weigh-ins or you had to go to websites and just see the results. There was never any context videos talking through this person was first on the scale, full of energy, looked great. This person was dead last, looked like they were going to die, barely made it. And now you have that context right here at We Want Picks. The featured prelim of the evening is not this fight, and I honestly think it should be. This is the co-featured prelim, which is not a thing, but this to me is actually the best undercard fight. Because this, to me, is going to dictate the future of a couple divisions, potentially. We have Calvin Qatar at 145 pounds taking on former 135-pound champion Aljamain Sterling. In fact, Aljamain Sterling is literally, I disagree with the statement I'm about to make, but statistically speaking, the greatest bantamweight of all time. I disagree with that statement. Completely disagree with that statement. But as far as title defenses are concerned, he is. He did just lose his belt, so he is moving up to 145 pounds, and this is his debut. That's why I think this fight is a very good fight, and it will tell us a lot about not only the bantamweight division, but the featherweight division going forward. We got Calvin Qatar, a big guy, 5'11", much bigger than Aljamain Sterling. He's a clean boxer, probably one of the best boxers around, just with pure boxing technique. He does have stoppages, but most of his knockouts, most of his stoppages are just incredible timing and not raw power. His hands are always exactly where they need to be. He cuts angles better than almost anybody. His takedown defense is listed at an incredible 91%, but I did my digging. I did my diving because I was like, 91%, you can't take this guy down. And then you go through the fight history and you look at every single fight. It hasn't truly been tested. He hasn't fought pure grapplers. He's fought some guys that have some wrestling technique. He's fought some guys that 
might want to get a takedown or two, but he hasn't fought somebody that is truly going to nonstop wrestle or shoot on him. So that 91 takedown defense is a little bit inflated. He is coming back after a year away, 18 months actually, and knee surgery. He just fought Arnold Allen, blew out his knee in that fight. It sidelined him for a year and a half, but he did get it fixed, and that does complicate things in this breakdown. He's taking on Aljamain Sterling. This guy is a backpack-style grappler, which means, if you're new here, backpack is, he's going to take you down, and he's just going to chill. He'll get your back, and he will literally just chill there. And you can't shake him. If you watched last week's fights, UFC Vegas 90, just like Damon Jackson, like Brendan Allen tried to be. Going to get the takedowns, going to get your back, and just chill. He's going to push for takedown after takedown. He will stick to you like an eighth layer of skin. And yes, I had to Google how many layers of skin there are, because I thought it was seven and I was like, seven? Is it seven? So I Googled it. It's seven. And then you add a layer because you can't shake the guy. And we're at eight. Over time, he has developed his own striking style. He uses kicks really well to manage range. He lands almost five significant strikes per minute. And he only absorbs about two. And that's because he does such a good job with his footwork and range control. He is coming off of that title loss to Sean O'Malley, who basically knocked him out cold in the second round and then forced him to move up to 145 pounds. And Aljamain Sterling, as much as I talked about how he's going to nonstop pressure forward, nonstop wrestle, is not a good wrestler. I will repeat that. Aljamain Sterling is not a good wrestler. His takedowns are actually pretty trash. He has a 24% takedown accuracy. He is, sit down, get a pen, write this number down, 12 and 63 in takedown attempts in his last five fights. In his last five fights, he got 12 takedowns. Yay, sounds great. He missed 63. He's not 12 for 63. He's 12 and 63 in his last five fights on takedown attempts. And that is a very important statistic here because Aljamain Sterling certainly cannot win a striking match. But as insane as that sounds, as insane as his low takedown percentage is, as insane as the 63 missed takedown attempts are, he is probably one of the best wrestlers that Qatar has fought. The only other two guys that actually tried to take Qatar down were Josh Emmett and Zabit, but neither one of them fully committed to the wrestling. If we know anything about Aljamain Sterling, it's that he is willing to fully commit to the wrestling. This entire fight is going to come down to Calvin Qatar's takedown defense. He will be light years ahead of Aljamain in the striking. And if he can keep this fight standing, it is just absolutely his decision to take. This is his fight and he will run away with it. The problem is there's a lot of unknowns in this fight. We don't know how Qatar is going to look after 18 months away and knee surgery. We don't know how Aljamain is going to look moving up in weight. If I assume that Qatar is good, peak form, the layoff didn't matter. He's the same guy after the layoff as he was before the layoff. Then I think he wins this fight. And this could look like Aaron Blanchfield versus Manon Faro. Just desperate, sloppy-ass takedowns. And then the better striker stuffing them, staying on the outside, and landing when needed. But assumptions in this sport don't typically pan out very well. And I'm just going to enjoy this fight for what it is. Aljo, honestly, probably sneaks out a very boring decision where he goes one for 26 in takedown attempts or some nonsense like that. The only reason I am going to slightly lean Aljamain Sterling here. I was actually on Qatar all week until I wrote my notes and then I, I flipped it. Just, just if I had to put numbers, it would be 51% Aljamain, 49 Calvin Qatar. Like it is razor thin. And the only reason that scales were tipped is because of the layoff. Calvin Qatar blew his knee out. He was gone for 18 months. And with strikers, we do see that there's a cadence to being in the octagon. There's a cadence to the striking. And that 18 months away, that ring rust, it might only be in the first round, but that sort of striking ring rust is probably going to be there. Aljamain just going to be diving at legs. The only saving grace here would potentially be as we know, Vegas judges seem to despise wrestlers. Over the last few months, we have had more wrestlers with plenty of takedowns and plenty of control time lose fights than we have in the last 10 years combined. 
Vegas does not care about wrestling anymore. They do not care about control time. They don't care about wrestling. They only care about striking. And that could help Kevin Qatar quite a bit. If Al Jermaine's just shooting, holding him in cage, not getting a full takedown, maybe getting half a takedown, Calvin pops back up. Calvin is going to get that decision every single time. Again, I have to make a pick because I'm filming the video. And if I don't make a pick, I'm going to hear about it. So Al Jermaine, very, very, very slight lean as the pick. And that takes us to the actual featured prelim of the evening. Former world champion Jiri Prohashka coming back after losing his belt or losing the opportunity to try to win his belt back. That was a tongue twister, but I promise you that was accurate. And he's doing so against Alexander Racic. And he spells Alexander wild. But Jiri Prohashka is a savage. He's a wild man. You look at the hair. When you have somebody with hair like that, there's two options. It's either a hippie that's living in Portland with a whole bunch of bumper stickers on either an electric car or a car that runs on old fry oil or like a savage beast that lives in the woods and rides boats like a Viking with an animal hat. Jiri's the second one. Savage beast that rides Viking boats with animal hats. But he is the former light heavyweight champion of the world. And he is a crazy person. He's incredibly fun to watch. He always brings the fight. He's a dangerous striker with pretty much all of his 29 wins coming by stoppage. He's got plenty of cardio, plenty of power, and up until his last fight, plenty of chin. The knock on Jiri, though, is how hittable he is. He is hit with more than five significant strikes per minute, which is an insanely high number, especially at this weight class. He does trust his chin, so he has no issues standing in the pocket, taking one, giving one, and just firing back and forth. That did, however, fail him in his last fight against Alex Pajeda, where he was stopped in the second round. Some people will argue that that stoppage was early, but I don't know how much was actually going to change if that ref didn't stump in. He's taking on oddly spelled Alexander Racic. This guy's a dynamic striker who uses his length really well, and he uses his reach to out-technique and out-decision his opponents. He mixes in kicks really well. He has no issues transitioning from leg kicks to head kicks while moving forward. And while he does have power, he likes to fight on the outside. He does not look for a brawl. He tries to avoid brawls. He tries to be a technical fighter. He's a low-volume, technical striker who uses footwork and distance control. He is coming back after nearly two years away after blowing out his leg in a loss to Jan Blahovich. The loss wasn't a true loss. He blew out his leg, so it is what it is. We didn't get enough fight to fully determine what we thought would happen. Without question, without question, Alexander Rasik is the better, more technical striker. It's not, it's not even up for debate. But he doesn't like a brawl. You can absolutely beat him by staying in his face and making it ugly. And that's who Jiri Prohashka is. As much of a Jiri hater as I am, I recognize that he is all gas, no brakes, insanely tough. And as long as his chin holds up, he will be in your face bringing the fight to you. I think Jiri wins this fight. Two years away from the cage and your first fight back is on the biggest card of all time against one of the most dangerous guys in the division. That is not a recipe for success. Unless the knockout loss completely changed how Jiri fights, which it might. We've seen people get knocked out and then their next fight out, they take their time. They, but that doesn't strike me as who Jiri is. Nothing bothers this guy. I think he's the same guy who comes forward a little bit chaotically, swinging wild, and wins this fight. Plus 110, Jiri is the underdog. Those odds seem juicy. Juicy like across like a, a, a big-backed woman at the mall. Juicy right across the sweatpants. That's what those odds are. I don't know if I'm going to bet it because I'm a conservative guy when it comes to betting on fights, but I think Jiri wins this fight. I mean, Alexander Rachik's been out for two years and didn't like people being in his face then. You think two years away is going to help? Oh, yeah, now I like a brawl. So I do like Jiri here. Similar to breakdown to what we had in the last fight with Qatar. I think layoffs matter, especially extended ones for strikers. Jiri Prohashka is the underdog pick in this fight. And I just want to take a second and remind you that if you sign up with our affiliates at wewantpicks.com slash bets, we send you $50. It's just that simple. Use the link, sign up, make a deposit. We send you 50 bucks. It's affiliate marketing. They're going to pay me. I'm going to whap, slice off some of that money and give it right back to you. 
you can then use that money to become a premium member. Premium membership has all the tools, the picks, the bets, the round line leans, the fantasy content, the betting content, anything you could ever want or need for only $10 for an entire month. A whole month. You're not just going to get UFC 300. You'll get UFC 300, UFC Vegas 91, and whatever the card is after that. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. It is only $10 a month. And one of the things you will get is the safety parlay. Safety parlay is 9 0 in the last six pay per views because I've given you more than one in a couple of those pay per views. Almost seven units of net profit across those pay per views. I've hit 12 of the last 17. It's only $10. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. And opening up the UFC 300 main card, we have former world champion Charles Oliveira taking on surging newcomer Armin Sarukian to determine who will fight for the title next. We have Charles Oliveira, one of the best fighters in UFC history, at least as far as technique is concerned. He is one of the most well-rounded guys we have ever seen step foot in the octagon. He has incredible kickboxing skills. He has laser pinpoint accuracy. His kicks are deadly and he throws to your legs, your body, and your head. He averages over two takedowns per 15 minutes and has some of the most practical BJJ in the UFC. What really separates him from the rest of the division is his ability to snap up submissions in any scramble and that is reflected in the record books because he quite literally has the most amount of submission wins in UFC history. He's coming off that knockout win over Benil Dariush which catapult him right back to the number one contender spot. He's taken on Armin Sarukian. This guy is an incredible wrestler who has managed to piece together a very nice striking game as well. He uses his footwork to set up both his strikes and his takedowns. He's athletic and he will mix in kicks very fluidly. He is the next generation of lightweight, right? He has that beast wrestling. He has very good striking. He's got plenty of cardio. He's not a one-dimensional guy. He's coming off that first round knockout win also over Benil Dariush. And I'm going to get a lot of hate for this breakdown. I'm fully prepared for people to be furious at me. And the reason I know that's what's going to happen is because a few weeks ago, I think it was at UFC 299, they had a panel. They had Alex Pajeda, Kayla Harrison, and Armin Sarukian on a panel taking questions from the audience. And everybody in the audience was like, I have a question for Armin. Hey, Armin, what are you going to do when Charles Oliveira beat your face in, you loser? Like, that that was the whole press con. I don't know why people absolutely hate Armin Sarukian. And I assume more of it is less about hating Armin and loving Charles Oliveira. And I appreciate And you, I said Charles Oliveira. And honestly, I, I don't have a lisp. And it might seem like I do in this breakdown. I'm not going to stick out my tongue, but... Yesterday, I trained on Saturday mornings and I basically bit half my tongue clean off. I took a guy down, I'm hanging out and he just, I've never been wrapped up in an inverted triangle so fast in my entire life and it just, just immediately bit my teeth down and it just whap right on my tongue. So tongue's a little swollen, okay? That's why I said Charles instead of Oliveira. But the reality is I think people just love Charles Oliveira so much that they can't possibly look at the situation logically and be like, he might lose this fight. This is similar hate that I got two years ago. Two years ago, Armin was a two-to-one favorite, a two-to-one favorite over Joel Alvarez. And I said, Armin blows through Joel. His wrestling is too good. And people came for my head. I have never received more hate in my life than when I said a two-to-one favorite was gonna beat Joel Alvarez, ever. It was crazy. The Joel enthusiast literally went nuts. I said a favorite was going to win. I mean, I was absolutely correct. Armin destroyed that dude. This feels very similar. Please, don't be mean in the comments. I, there's only so many fat cracks I can take in a week in the comment section. And you guys are getting creative with them. Somebody said I was built like a turkey. My wife loved that one, so thanks for that. But this feels similar to that fight. Charles Oliveira is one of the most liked and most supported fighters in the UFC, and he should be. But styles make fights. And the last time Charles fought somebody who was not afraid to take him down and follow him to the ground, he lost his title, and that was to Islam. I think Armin is basically Islam. I think he's got slightly better striking, slightly worse wrestling, and I think he wins here. The odds makers think he wins as well, but the public disagrees. 65% of the public has picked Charles Oliveira to win this fight. Don't come for my head. If I am wrong, I will apologize. I'm just trying to look at fights objectively and do my best job to pick winners. 
I think the favorite in this fight is the favorite for a reason. We watched Charles Oliveira get taken down, get submitted by another wrestler. Armin's going to do more of the same. That's the pick, guys. Please, everybody, stay calm. And then in another controversial fight, we got Bo Nickel taking on Cody Brundage. And this is controversial because of its main card slot. A lot of people look at the card. A lot of people say, with 12 current and former world champions, how the hell did Bo Nickel with only five fights in the UFC get him on the main card? I mean, we know how. He's who the UFC wants to be the next big thing. And I get it. The UFC needs to build superstars. And actually, the main event for this fight tells you that. The UFC tried to get John Jones. They couldn't. Tried to get Conor McGregor. They couldn't. Then they were like, well, we don't have any. That's it. Those are the only two truly giant megastars that we have left. Those two guys. And they couldn't get them. So now they need to build the next generation of megastar. And they think Bo Nickel is going to be one of them. And he might be. He is a big time wrestler. A multiple time division one national champion. A world champion wrestler. He obviously has that incredible wrestling and he transitioned it to MMA very well. He's taken those skills into the octagon with him. But his style is pretty obvious, right? Strike as little as possible, work in the takedowns, get the jujitsu going, which is jujitsu is very good as well. He has five professional fights with five stoppages. The most recent was actually a standing one punch knockout over Val Woodburn, which tells us that either Bo Nickel has some power in his hands or Val Woodburn's not very good. He did step up on insanely short notice. Bo Nickel is taking on Cody Brundage, and a lot of people go back and forth on Cody and his skill sets, but Cody will be the best fighter Bo Nickel has fought so far. I mean, this is a natural evolution. Cody Brundage is a heavy-handed, killer-be-killed kind of guy. He's also a wrestler. He has no problem charging forward, throwing heavy, and then working in his own takedowns. He does have pretty high-level wrestling. Nowhere near Bo Nickel's, but pretty high-level wrestling in his background. And he brings that to the cage himself. He averages almost three takedowns per fight. But even dominant wrestling, big power, athleticism can't always help him get wins. He does have some questionable fight IQ. Go back to the SD Dumas fight. Very clear he could outgrapple SD Dumas. Took that dude down in less than one second. And then started pulling guillotine for some reason. And it's those decisions which can get him in some trouble or get some fights away from him that he probably could have won. He is coming off of that rampage Jackson style slam over Zach Reese where he knocked that dude out, slamming him to get out of a triangle. This is fist fighting. Of course, Cody Brundage can win this fight. Of course he can. In fact, he's knocked out as many people as Bo Nickel has fought. Cody Brundage has five knockout wins. Bo Nickel has only fought five people. Cody Brundage has three times the amount of MMA experience. He's got plenty of power, his own wrestling credentials, but the minus 2,400 odds on Bo Nickel right now are honestly correct. That converts. If you take minus 2,400 and you convert it to the implied probability, that's 96%. And I am 96% sure that Bo Nickel wins this fight. He should come forward, wrestle early, and get it done. Cody is insanely dangerous. If somebody is going to fraud check Bo Nickel, it could be Cody Brunich. He has that big-ass power that he will sit on. And in this type of fight, a game plan is useless. It's useless. Eventually, Bo Nickel will get a takedown. So I would not spend my whole camp trying to defend takedowns. I think I spend my camp planting my feet with my hands, ready to go, trying to connect, trying to make Bo Nickel pay. I think that's how I spend my camp. You can't come charging forward at Bo because he will just lower his level and shoot. You have to wait for him to come to you and just blast as hard as you can and try to let those hands go. I don't think it's going to matter. It's a fist fight. Anything can happen. We have seen what this would actually be the biggest upset in the history of the sport. Bo Nickel right now is the biggest favorite in the history, at least of the UFC. Nobody has ever been this big of a favorite before. But I have to go Bo Nickel. The 2,400 odds are, are nuts. I think they're correct, but they're nuts. If you don't fully understand how betting odds work, the way that you look at it, a minus is a favorite, a plus is an underdog. He's minus 2,400. So that means you would have to bet $2,400 to win $100. You give them $2,400. You give them a mortgage payment and they hand you back $2,500. You made $100. That is not worth it. Let's see what the odds are on under one and a half. Maybe that'll be minus 500. That'll be worth it. 
There's no way that this fight goes over one and a half rounds. No way. Cody doesn't go over one and a half rounds. Bo Nickel hasn't seen a second round. Like, there's no way this fight goes over one and a half rounds. Bo Nickel's either going to be knocked out cold or finish Cody, and that's it. That's the breakdown, guys. Don't par- don't parlay him either. I know a lot of you guys love doing that. Like, oh, he's a guaranteed win. Just add him on. You don't get anything for that. Like, it adds nothing to your parlay. It adds nothing except risk. And I don't think he loses. But for an extra $1 on your payout, are you really going to add another person in a fist fight? It's not worth it. Don't do it. Then we have the first of three title fights. This is the BMF title. And it's sort of a made-up belt, but it does have an interesting history. I do think it has lost its soul, though. BMF stands for Bad Mother. It's exactly what you think it stands for. It was originally created for a fight between George Masvidal and Nate Diaz. And the only reason the UFC invented this belt was so that they had a belt on the line for the main event of UFC 244. But it made sense at the time. Nate Diaz and George Masvidal were both badasses in the cage and no-nonsense guys out of it. At the time, the UFC said it was a one-off belt. It would not be defended. And well, here we are. Masvidal's retired. The belt was up for grabs. I guess they said, we need an active BMF guy. And so the Justin Gagey fought Dustin Poirier in a battle of two of the nicest human beings in this sport. Made no, might as well let Wonder Boy fight for the BMF belt. Made no sense. Justin Gagey won the belt. And now he's defending it. So again, this went from a one-off belt that was just a fun thing for the UFC to do They said it would never be defended. Now it has lineage. It has moved over to Justin Gagey and he's defending it. Kind of a mess, but it's going to be fun nonetheless. And what is really cool, if you're an old school UFC fan like I am, I've been watching UFC since I was a a wee child. I saw the very first one in 1993 and I've seen pretty much every single one since. We used to go to my cousin's house in Queens, New York and watch it on the D Scrambler. If any of you are old enough to know what the hell that is, you used to be able to watch the Spice Channel or the Playboy Channel, you could hear it. And so, I mean, the sounds. You could hear it, but you couldn't see it. It was a whole bunch of squiggly colored lines. It was chaos, but you could hear it. And I mean, that was a middle, middle school kid's dream. But some of the shadier people, like my cousins, had a de-scrambler. And it was a box. You, you took the cord from the wall, you plugged into that box, and that box went to your TV. And it would de-scramble that signal. So we would, you could get the Spice Channel, but you also could watch all the pay-per-views. And that's how I saw all the early UFCs. And then the UFC was kicked off of television. There were no rules. It was chaos. They kicked it off. You had to go to Sam Goody, which is like a doesn't exist anymore. You'd buy videotapes and DVDs and everything else. You'd have to go there to buy the tapes to watch the events because they were kicked off of television. Then it got regulated. They added rules and now it exists. Anyway, where the hell was I going with this? Holy crap. I, I, oh man, I, this whole thing was like, be young and cool. And then all I did was show that I have Alzheimer's. I don't know where, I literally have no idea where I was going with that. But either way, we got the BMF belt on. Oh, that's where I was going with that. The person presenting the BFFL, BMF belt is Mark Coleman. Mark Coleman, old school UFC heavyweight champion. Guy was a beast. One of the true, like, super-ish stars of the sport would come forward, wrestle, just bash your face in and win fights like that. Mark Coleman, he's he's like 60-something now, long retired. Mark Coleman, his house or his parents' house burned to the ground. This is a couple of weeks ago. Burned to the ground. And he ran in there, into the fire, carried his parents out of the house and he got burned up. He was in the ICU, he was in the hospital for a few days, risked his own life to save his parents, tried to save his dog, wasn't able to do that. And then Max Holloway and Justin Gagey both said, the BMF is Mark Coleman. This guy who risked his life to save his loved ones, he's the BMF. I want him to present the belt to us, not The Rock. The Rock is who has presented it in the past. So Mark Coleman will be presenting this belt. Nice little piece of nostalgia for old school the scrambler fans like myself. Anyway, back to the breakdown. We got Justin Gagey taking on Max Holloway. Justin Gagey is a wrestler. He wrestled in college. He's a wrestler at his core, but he did go 10 fights in the UFC without a single takedown. He's a striker in style. He has power. He has volume. Pretty much every single strike he throws is a significant strike. Hence, the more than seven landed per minute. Unfortunately, he is hit 
with just as many. He has a negative striking differential. A guy that lands seven significant strikes per minute is somehow hit more than he hits other people. He marches forward. He throws heavy. He will stay in your face. He loves ugly fights, and he thrives in the chaos. He absolutely destroys people physically. He's coming off that BMF win over Dustin Poirier where he knocked him out cold with a head kick. He's taking on Max Holloway. Max Holloway is a 145 pounder that is fighting for this belt at 155 pounds. When they asked him, why the hell are you doing that? Especially now that Ilya just beat Volkanovski, they were like, Max, you probably would have gotten the next title shot. And he was very pragmatic about it. That means logical. He basically said, in this sport, if you wait, Everything can pass you by. I'm not going to wait for that belt. I'm going to fight for this one. I only have a few years of good career left, and I'm going to use it to make my money and have fun fights. So that's why he stepped up here, and we appreciate that. Max is a great. We love watching Max Holloway fight because he's an amazing striker. He has very fluid movements. He keeps his volume and his pressure up. He has an impressive striking differential of 7-4, to four, and he couples that with an 84% takedown defense with an entire championship career worth of experience. He is a staple at 145 pounds, where his only loss in the last 10 years was to the perennial champion at the time, Alexander Volkanovsky. This will be his second fight at 155 pounds. The first was a loss to Dustin Poirier back in the day, like a couple years. And he is coming off that stoppage win over a Korean Zami last summer. This should be an incredibly fun fight. Both of these guys are willing to slug it out. Both of them land at an incredible pace. Justin will have the clear power advantage. Max is going to have the volume and speed advantage. I think Max is one of the most live underdogs on the main card. He's got a great chin, plenty of five-round experience, and the more technical striking. But Justin's power is next level. He absolutely ruins people's faces. And while I do think Justin wins, I think the minus 200 odds are too wide. Justin gets hit a ton. Max has a handful of the highest volume striking fights in the UFC history. Literally has landed more strikes than anybody else in the history of UFC. I think Max is going to hang and the five rounds will only help Max. Justin does have the wrestling if he needs it. And that's why I'm going to give him the slight edge in this fight. I think Justin has the wrestling. He certainly has the power, and that's going to give him the slight edge. But Max Holloway could piece this dude up, hang out, avoid the power, and squeeze out what's going to be a very fun, interesting decision. This is a great fight. Justin Gagey is going to be the pick, but I would not be parlaying Justin Gagey against somebody like Max Holloway. Then we have the co-main event of the evening. We have Wei Li Zhang taking on Yanan Zhan, and this is the first ever Chinese fighter versus Chinese fighter to win a title. So congratulations to both of these women. But I don't think this is going to be a competitive fight. And I'll tell you why. Wei Li Zhang is the former and then now current champion of the world. She's a striker who has evolved into a true mixed martial artist. She has very real power in her hands. She lands at an impressive almost six significant strikes per minute. She's added wrestling to her game plan with 19 takedowns in her UFC career. She's coming off that title defense over Amanda Lamoche, where she outlanded her 163 to 24, and she had six takedowns. She landed 163 strikes and was only hit with 24 in return. That's how dominant Wei Li was in her last fight. She's taking on Yan Zhanan. And Yan Zhanan is a very good boxer with well-timed strikes. She's got clean technique, but she does not shy away from a dirty fight, and she is willing to bank. Outside of her two UFC losses, which were to Carla Esparza and Marina Rodriguez, she has had dominant run in the UFC. She showcased her power in her last fight with a knockout over Jessica Andrade, but that seems to be the anomaly. She's typically a busy striker with decent takedown defense who looks to decision her way to a win. Yan has entered this title shot with a handful of solid performances, but Wei Li could eventually go down as the greatest female fighter of all time. She's good literally everywhere. She is going to be my most confident pick on this card. I am more confident in Wei Li than I am in Bo Nickel because Wei Li is at least tried, true, tested. Wei Li is better than her opponent in every single aspect of MMA. Wei Li has to be the pick, and you could definitely use her as a parlay anchor. And then we have the main event of the evening at the biggest UFC event of all time. We have current light heavyweight champion Alex Pajeda defending his belt against former 
light heavyweight champion Jamal Hill. Jamal Hill didn't lose his belt because he lost the fight. Jamal Hill lost his belt because he blew out his Achilles. And this should be a very interesting fight because Alex Pajeda, as we all know, is a kickboxing beast. He's a very high-level kickboxer. He beat Israel Adesanya three times. Then he moved up to light heavyweight and he looks the part. He is a massive six foot four. He seems to be faster and healthier without cutting down to middleweight. The clear path is to take this guy down. And while he does have a 70% takedown defense, he has been taken down eight times. He's coming off the second round knockout win over Yuri Prohaska to become a two division UFC champion in an incredible seven UFC fights. Alex Pajeda only has seven fights in the UFC. And he won the middleweight belt, won the light heavyweight belt, and is about to defend it. It's absolutely insane what this guy has done in a short UFC career. He is taking on Jamal Hill. He's the former light heavyweight champion of the world who had to relinquish his title when he blew out his Achilles playing basketball. That's right, basketball. He's a tall, rangy striker who comes forward and picks his shots really well. He has an incredible 7-3 to three striking differential, meaning he has high volume and he doubles his opponent's strikes and isn't hit very much at all. He is primarily a boxer, but he does have some solid leg kicks that he can use to keep distance. He's got good power, good volume, and accuracy, which makes him a very real threat on the feet. He has a 73% takedown defense, which he might not need in this fight. He is returning to the cage after more than a year away. There are two things to note here. First of all, a lot of people think that Alex's stoppage over Yuri Prohashka was early. And in my opinion, even if it was a touch early, which it may have been, not much was gonna change in the coming minutes. Second, Jamal Hill had a major injury that required major surgery, and a lot of people think he's coming back a little too soon, and I agree with that notion. I feel like the UFC was in a hard spot trying to find the main event that lived up to the UFC 300 hype. Connor was off the table. John Jones was injured. Francis left the UFC, and anybody else with any notoriety was already booked or not heavy enough to main event. And you know the UFC wasn't going to put up a 135 pounder in the main event of UFC 300. So the UFC called Jamal Hill and he couldn't pass this up. He himself said they didn't ask him to main event this fight until the days before the announcement. And this was just announced a little while ago, which means this fight was sort of an afterthought. This was something that they just put together. It also means that Jamal Hill wasn't training for this for 12 weeks. Jamal Hill didn't know he was going to be the main event of a huge card. He didn't, may not have even known he was going to fight anytime soon. I do think Alex is going to win this fight. He hits like a freight train. He's physically imposing and his calf muscles have been attached to his heels for the last year. But with that being said, Alex gets hit a ton. And Jamal might actually be the better striker here. I saw a video on YouTube a few weeks ago. It was called, Alex Bejeda is allergic to jabs. And it was literally a highlight of him just getting blasted with jabs or hit with one-twos like it didn't matter. It was a highlight of Alex Bejeda having no striking defense whatsoever. And that actually concerned me. That made me be, oh shit, Jamal Hill is probably going to win this fight. But once you get the layoff, you get the injury, I have no idea what kind of camp Jamal Hill has been in. We have seen Jamal Hill lurking in the background of a couple of pay-per-views, and he looks like somebody's uncle. Dude, he had a beer belly, a ridiculous shirt that was the buttons stopped at the sternum. He's looked absurd and fat and soft. And that wasn't that long ago. So I don't know the kind of shape he's going to, and he was never like a jacked kind of guy, but I don't know what kind of shape he's going to be in. I don't know if his time is going to be off. I don't know if he's fully, I don't know any of these things. I do know Alex Pajeda hits like a baseball bat. And I think Alex Pajeda wins this fight, but it would not surprise me if Jamal Hill landed those one twos and we just watched Alex get pieced up because he does get hit. Either way, this is a really good main event, guys. That is my breakdown for UFC 300. I do ask that you become a premium member. It's the greatest way to support us, and you are going to get the greatest premium package in this space. You're going to get picks, bets, tools, round line leans, and more. One of those tools is the line movement tracker. This is going to give you the opening odds, the current odds, and the win probability for every single fighter on every single card. You're also going to get the detailed data, metrics, and analytics. 38 columns of information that you can use to find your bets or to avoid others. You're also going to get the best DraftKings ownership projections in the game preloaded 
into the DraftKings Optimizer. This will build a lineup for you. This will build 150 different DraftKings fantasy lineups for you. You're also going to get more than just me and that leprechaun that I do the show with. You're going to get Artem, who breaks down far more than just UFC, and the pick doctor, who is giving you artificial intelligence picks based solely off of historical data. Every single thing that I just mentioned and more is available for only $10 a month. You can cancel whenever you want. There's no weird tiers. We're not separating fantasy from bets. Easy breezy. $10, everything you've ever needed. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top.